Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. Today, I am going to cover five areas that new CNC users might not be familiar with and might not fully understand, but if you can get down these fundamentals and it will definitely increase your probability of being successful with your CNC machine. So, all right, if you're new to CNC or if you just wanna learn, come along and let's go ahead and get into the first tip. The first tip that I want to cover in this series is perhaps one of the most essential and the most important to making sure your projects come out successfully, and that is ensuring that you home your machine and you zero your bit properly. And so I'm going to very briefly discuss what the difference is between the two and why you need to do them. So first, right off the bat, homing your machine is telling your machine what its boundaries are. Generally speaking, machines have a default home position. So for something like the Onefinity or the X-Carve, the home position is generally in the front left-hand corner of the machine. And so as the machine powers up, the first thing you should do is home. And that tells the machine where it's known good location is and if your software is smart enough it'll also know what the size of the machine is and so it can use those two pieces of information to know what the outside boundaries of your machine are and if you load a file into it that is bigger than your machine or bigger than the boundaries then it should flag that and protect you from running into the side or the back. If your machine does not have software that's capable of doing that, you do need to home anyway because that'll tell your machine where it wants to return to when it's done cutting or when you want to go back to the home position to reset zero, it'll know where to go. And so now the homing process is not strictly required. For the Onefinity, is highly desirable because it does allow you to set those soft limits of the machine. There are features in both the Shape Oco as well as the X-Carve that allow you to set those soft limits as well. So homing, once again, not completely required, but highly, highly advisable. So now, now you understand what homing means, what do you mean by zeroing? Well, zeroing is a process where you tell the machine where your workpiece is relative to your end mill or the bit that you are using. And so this step is essential. You cannot successfully create a project without doing this step. And so the simple way to do the zeroing process is once you have your workpiece affixed to your wasteboard, you move your bit to where you set your zero position to be in your cam software. That generally can be the lower right corner of your workpiece, or in some cases, the center of your workpiece. And just be clear about whether or not you are zeroing at the top of your workpiece or at the bottom or the top of the wasteboard. And those are very important factors in making sure you get successful outcomes. And so once you jog your bit to where you want zero to be on the X and Y, then you simply select through your controller to zero those points out. And then you take your bit, you jog it down, you make sure that it's just barely touching your work surface. You can do this with a piece of paper or the little spin technique that I learned from Two Moose Designs. And uh, then you just press the zero button on the Z axis and then you have both your X, Y, and your Z axis zeroed out and you can begin your cut. And so this is completely dependent on where you set Z in your CAM software. So these two things have to marry up for a successful outcome. The next area that I would like to cover is perhaps one of the most essential pieces of CNC, and it is one of the more complicated and least understood pieces of CNC, and that is your feeds, speeds, and depths of cut. And so what does this mean? This is how fast the machine is moving through the material and how deep it is cutting as it is moving through the material. And so these things are interrelated. They are interrelated to each other. They are interrelated to the material we're cutting and the bit that you're using. This is why it is complicated, but I want to provide some general guidelines that you can use if you're not familiar with feeds and speeds that'll get you up and running and then you can kind of branch out from there. So the first recommendation is in terms of depth of cut. Generally, I recommend not using a depth of cut that is deeper than a half of the diameter of the bit. So for example, if you have a quarter inch end mill, then I would not cut deeper than one eighth of an inch. 
Likewise, I recommend cutting between 60 and 80 inches per minute on most hobbyist machines. That's a fairly good speed that allows you to get optimized cutting in terms of time, uh, but also isn't too aggressive that it's gonna cause some delirious outcomes. Now, I mentioned earlier that feeds and speeds and everything are interrelated, so the speed at which you cut is completely dependent on your end mill and the material you're cutting in, and so it does depend on the number of flutes you have, it depends on whether you're cutting in something that is extremely hard versus something that is extremely soft, and in some cases, if you have material that is very, very soft, like something like foam, there are special bits that you want to use to optimize your cutting parameters. And so that's a little bit beyond the scope of the this video, but it's just something that I would point out. If you are interested and you want to dive deeper into this, I will leave some links down below in the description that I really talk about this at a greater depth. And I will also offer that I did co-develop some software to help new users with this process. And so Ed and I did develop an application that you can select your machine, select your spindle, select your material, select your end mill, and it'll recommend a range of feeds and speeds and depths of cut for for you to use that are fairly optimized. They're a little bit more aggressive than maybe some of the defaults in some of the software packages, um, but they are going and using some manufacturer recommended parameters for the bit in the material. So it's a little bit more granular than you can get out of say something like easel, for example, um, but it's not as fully complicated as one of those master mechanics sort of manual that talks about all the different variabilities you can get in your material. So if you're interested in that, I will also link that down below. The next area that I wanna cover is a little bit more of an advanced topic, but is something that I really think will help new users bolster their confidence as well as increase the probability of success and that is the use of simulations within a CAM software. Now, most of the major software packages on the market today do have live simulations in them, even if they're free or paid. And so I highly encourage new users to use this simulation feature to sort of validate and check that what they're doing with their toolpaths is gonna to result in the outcome they're looking for. So go ahead, turn on your stock, look at your toolpath running, make sure nothing happens, make sure the machine is not crashing in anything or the bit's not crashing in anything, uh, and then just look at the resultant outcome. Now, by way of evidence of the use of simulations. I have a little project that I created not so long ago that I did not simulate or at least not simulate thoroughly enough and I ended up with a little bit of a whoopsies or some hiccups during the manufacturing process and I want to show you what I did with the toolpath and the things that I did and had I paid more close attention to the simulation than I probably would have caught before I actually made the product. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to Fusion 360 and walk you through what I did. All right, here we are in Fusion, and what you see in front of you is a relatively simple model of a spice holder or a salt holder. And what it has is a little lid on top that spins out, and it is a series of concentric rings that I intend to glue together. Now, I chose to do concentric rings because it allows me to make the rings out of different woods, which would be an interesting design feature. And more importantly, though, uh, it allows me to use wood that is about an inch thick, which is a lot easier to mill than something that is super tall like this four and a half inch tall spice jar. So certainly finding four and a half inches worth of wood would be kind of challenging and then cutting it to an appropriate depth would be equally challenging on the CNC. So I chose to do it this way and I think it's produced an interesting outcome. Now where things sort of went sideways is I had cut each one of these rings individually by uh, doing a profile on the inside and a profile on the outside. Very straightforward from a cam perspective, but I had a little wrinkle whenever I developed the tool pass, which I'm going to show here. So to start off with, I'm going to turn off some of the bodies that we don't need for this simulation here and uh, just look at the things that are required for the actual toolpath. And so when I click on the toolpath here, Fusion goes ahead and it shows you what it's going to look like when the toolpath is finished. Now this is something that they added recently to the new version of the software. Uh, in the past you had to simulate to see this, but this is actually kind of helpful. And it does allow me to show very specifically this little U-shape cutout that I got whenever I was making the part. I did not see it or I did not notice it during the simulation process, but what had happened is a series of concentric circles were here made to hog out that kind of 
inner diameter. And as the machine was finishing up with the very last path, it was swinging out and then retracting all the way up. And what that did is it created this little uh, gouge in the material. And so the way this manifested itself in our real world is uh, the machine was cutting along. I wasn't quite paying attention to it. It was almost done. I thought I was in the clear. And all of a sudden there was a very loud shrieking sound coming from the machine. Clearly the machine had dug in the material in a place that I did not necessarily intend it to uh, and then it retracted very quickly and returned to the home position uh, then when I looked at the action material I saw this U now the problem here is it is a full depth cut of the entire thickness of the material which as we've previously discussed is about two to four times or even six or eight times deeper than I would recommend cutting with a bit at any one time so you had an entire essentially an entire inch worth of material being chipped away by that bit uh, at the uh, uh, feed rate that I had specified for this cut, which in this case was uh, half a diameter's depth of cut. So that was very startling to me. It wasn't something that I was expecting and it's something super easy to fix. It's a little bit of a nuance of Fusion 360 by having lean in and lean out turned on. So to fix it, all I had to do was just simply turn that off. Uh, but had I paid closer attention to the simulation here, I would have seen this cut out. I would have said, hey, that's not something that I want in the final product. And so in this case, it did not ruin the product. Uh, this is just a throwaway piece anyway, that center circle. Um, but had it been something maybe on the outside where it dug into the material that I wanted to keep, it would have ruined that ring and it would have been very unfortunate. So the whole point of all of this is just to say go ahead and use those simulation features look at them very closely watch it play out if you have the time to do so and just make sure that what you're commanding your machine to do and what you're commanding the cam software to do that it is actually doing in real life now that's no guarantee that your machine won't screw up for some reason or something might go wrong with the mechanics of the machine but it does dramatically increase the probability of success by looking at the simulation and making sure you're really getting what you're looking for The next area that I want to get into that trips up some new users and beginning CNC hobbyists is really just using the wrong bit for the wrong occasion. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you want to remove a large amount of material, you certainly don't want to use the smallest bit that you have in your arsenal. On the flip side, if you want to remove a little bit of material, maybe using the largest bit you have is not the best choice. So it is best to try and um, optimize your bit selection for the type of operation you are conducting. And so there are a handful of bits that I do recommend that every CNC hobbyist have. Now you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive bits, but having these on hand are going to be really useful. And some of the bits I recommend, for example, are a quarter inch two flute end mill, a one eighth inch uh, end mill with two flutes as well, and then one or two larger bits. And what I mean by that is something like a spoil board flattening bit, which is a fairly inexpensive expensive, but it allows you to flatten your spoil board very quickly. It would take you much, much longer to do that with a quarter inch end mill than it would with something like a one inch white side flattening bit, for example. The other larger bit that I do have a tendency to recommend is some sort of bowl carving bit. So if you want to remove a lot of material, these bits are usually uh, three quarters, one inch, or even one and a quarter inches wide. So they will allow you to remove a lot of material horizontally anyway, and then you can cut, uh, you know, slowly cut deeper down into the material to get that depth that you're looking for. So things like this really allow you to optimize your cut parameters right off the bat. And so once you have these kind of basic bits, you can branch out and get some additional bits. For example, some V cutters and some smaller diameter bits if you want to do more fine work or some ball end mills if you want to do some 3D cutting. So if you are interested in a deeper dive into bits, I do have a dedicated video, which I will link above and link below. And so you can check that out. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. The last area that I want to cover for new users to try and avoid, and that is taking on too much too quickly with complicated projects. 
So I really do recommend starting out simple, starting out with simple 2D or 2.5D cuts and really easing your way into this CNC hobby. So get familiar with your feeds and speeds, get familiar with the way your machine sounds, get familiar with the material relative to the bit and your machine. So each material you're cutting in with different bits will sound differently, they will respond differently to your machine, uh, you will get different chip sizes and you will get different outcomes. So just start with a series of projects that are relatively simple with simple profiles and simple pocketing operations just to get comfortable with your machine, the software, the workflow, as well as the bits and the materials. And then once you have maybe two or three or four or five uh, projects under your belt that are successful, that you learn the nuances of the software in your machine and the material, then you can branch out into something that may be more complicated, that has a more variety of different bits required or different cuts that are required, and things that use more expensive, more exotic materials. I certainly would not recommend jumping into your first project being a very complicated 3D carve and some very expensive hardwoods, for example. Uh, so you just want to guarantee or at least increase your probability of success by starting simple and then working your way up. Just like any hobby or anything that you do in life, practice will make you better. And so starting out small, starting out simple and working your way up to the complicated things is definitely something that I recommend and I cannot stress enough how you really need to learn the end-to-end -end process and get comfortable with it before you get into something that's really, really complicated. Now, I'm not saying you can't be successful right off the bat. You certainly can. In many cases, this might be that you've followed the process very consistently and you know what you're doing or at least you studied a lot. And there is the outside probability that success is just purely luck. I've had both good and bad luck with my machine in the past. Even still today, I have whoopsies quite frequently. And it's not because I don't know what I'm doing necessarily. It's because I get complacent or I am really not paying attention or I am lacking some due diligence that I need throughout the process on some of the steps that I've covered here in this video. So if you like this video and you think you're getting value out of it, I very much appreciate a thumbs up on the video. It really helps YouTube tell everyone that it's a good video and more people should see it. If you didn't like the video for some reason, well, please leave your comments down below. Let me know why and we can try to make future videos better. If you're not already following me on Instagram, please consider doing so. That's where I post pictures of projects like this to become future videos. Once again, thank you so much for watching the video. Thank you so much for getting this far and don't forget to be inspired. The next area that I want to talk about is something that is slightly little bit, just slightly little bit. The next area that I think new users and beginning CNC, you, beginner, beginner. You want to remove just a little bit of material. You don't want to use the biggest bit in your arsenal. 